Hi, thank you for joining me today. My name is Nicole Gentili and I'm a PhD candidate with the UC Davis Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory Point of Care Technology Center. Our center's website and email address are listed here for correspondence. Our focus is point of care pathogen detection for critical emergency and disaster care. Today I would like to talk to you about basic microbiology and culture techniques which aid in detecting pathogens. My goal today is to provide you with an overview of basic microbiology and the concepts involved, including the bacterial growth curve and classifying organisms based on morphologies. I will then move on to describe blood, urine, and skin and soft tissue cultures, focusing on the types of media, sample collection processes, culture procedures, as well as speciation and susceptibility testing. I will proceed to explain basic staining procedures such as the simple stain, gram stain, spore stain, negative stain, and acid fast stains. Included in the staining procedure descriptions will be explanations of the organisms that the strains identify, or that the, that the stains identify. In addition to staining procedures, biochemical tests used for differentiating bacteria will be discussed. Lastly, I will briefly mention some facts about fungi and viruses, focusing on the current 2009 novel H1N1 influenza pandemic. Before jumping into the first topic, which focuses on basic microbiology, I would like to point out a nice quote from Charles Darwin, whose name you may recognize as being the founder of the theory of natural selection. Darwin realized that all species of life have evolved over time from common ancestors. He published compelling supporting evidence of this in his 1859 book, On the Origin of Species, where he presented his scientific theory of natural selection, which is responsible for the branching pattern of evolution. To begin, let's discuss some basic bacterial cell morphology. The morphologies shown in this figure are not all-encompassing, they are just the most common. The figure is split up into three sections based on cell shapes. Section 1 on the left lists common cocci. Cocci is plural for coccus, which means sphere. Cocci may be true spheres, for example, staphylococci, helmet-shaped, for example, pneumococci, or kidney-shaped, for example, neisseriae. They may occur alone in pairs or in groups. If found in pairs, they are called diplococci. Threes are a triad, and groups of four are called tetracoccus. Other group types include streptococcus, which are cocci in change, sarcina cubes of eight, and staphylococcus irregular clusters. Diseases caused by cocci include, but are not limited to, pneumonia, tonsillitis, endocarditis, meningitis, sepsis, and various skin diseases. Section 2, moving counterclockwise to the lower right, we have the bacilli. Bacilli is plural for bacillus, which means rod-shaped. Similar to cocci, the bacillus group includes diplobacillus, streptobacillus, and cocobacillus. Please take careful note of the ambiguity here that can create considerable confusion. The term bacillus, capitalized and italicized, is also the name of a genus that, among many other genera, falls within the class bacilli. Bacillus, in the case of this figure, is a generic term to describe the morphology of any rod-shaped bacterium. This general term does not mean that the subject is a member of class bacilli or genus bacillus. Thus, it does not necessarily imply a similar group of characteristics. Not all members of class bacilli are rod-shaped, and many other rod-shaped bacteria that do not fall within that class exist. Most bacterial species are either spherical, rod-shaped, or a version of the two. This is shown in section 3, which I have classified here as other. Some rod-shaped bacteria, called vibrio, are slightly curved or coma-shaped. Others can be spiral-shaped, called spirilla, or tightly coiled, called spirochetes. A small number of species even have tetrahedral or cuboidal shapes. More recently, bacteria were discovered deep under the Earth's crust that grow as long rods with a star-shaped cross-section. The large surface area to volume ratio of this morphology may give these bacteria an advantage in nutrient-poor environments. This wide variety of shapes is determined by the bacterial cell wall and cytoskeleton and is important because it can influence the ability of bacteria to acquire nutrients, attach to surfaces, swim through liquids, and escape predators.
Bacterial growth occurs when bacterial cells divide into two daughter cells by a process called binary fission. The resulting daughter cells are identical, providing that no mutational event occurred. Hence, local doubling occurs. This figure illustrates a typical bacterial growth curve with time and hours on the x-axis and log base 10 of the number of bacteria on the y-axis. Numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4 represent lag, exponential or stationary, and death phases, respectively. During lag phase, bacteria monitor their environment and adapt themselves to growth conditions. This is the period where the individual bacteria are maturing but are not able to divide. In this phase, synthesis of RNA, enzymes, and other molecules occurs. Exponential phase, some kind sometimes called the log phase, is a period characterized by cell doubling. The number of new bacteria appearing per unit time is proportional to the present population. If growth is not limited, doubling will continue at a constant rate so both the number of cells and the rate of population increase doubles with each consecutive time period. For this type of exponential growth, plotting the natural logarithm of cell number against time produces a straight line. The slope of this line is the specific growth rate of the organism, which is a measure of the number of divisions per cell per unit time. The actual rate of this growth, i.e. the slope of the line in the figure, depends upon the growth conditions, which affect the frequency of cell division events and the probability of both daughter cells surviving. Exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely, however, because the medium is soon depleted of nutrients and enriched with waste. During stationary phase, the growth rate slows as a result of nutrient depletion and accumulation of toxic products. This phase is reached as the bacteria begin to exhaust the resources that are available to them. Some may use the term cryptic growth, which means even though bacterial growth may still be occurring, the slope of the line plateaus because the rate of growth is equal to the rate of bacterial death. Finally, during death phase, bacteria run out of nutrients and die. Here the rate of death exceeds the rate of growth. The measurement of an exponential bacterial growth curve in batch culture was traditionally a part of the training of all microbiologists. That pretty much covers all I wanted to mention in the introduction section. Now let's move on to discussing some common culture methods performed for pathogen identification. The first culture method we will discuss is blood culture. Blood culture is the principal diagnostic method for detecting and diagnosing bacteremia and fungemia, exhibiting a sensitivity ranging from 3.18 to 3,000 colony forming units per milliliter, or CFUs per mil. Before I describe the process of blood culture in detail, I want to talk about some of the media used. The seven types of media listed in this figure are the most common, Biomuro Bac T Alert blood culture bottles. The standard aerobic and anaerobic bottles are most frequently used for blood culture. Each contain 40 milliliters of su supplemented triptic soy broth and can be dosed with up to 10 milliliters of sterile body fluid or blood. Like many other methods of pathogen detection, blood culture has its disadvantages. One disadvantage is that antimicrobial therapy has been shown to reduce the effectiveness by 71.8% in spiked blood samples. Therefore, blood culture sample collection is recommended before initiation of antimicrobial treatment. This is not always possible in critically ill patients, however, due to high risk of mortality associated with delayed treatment. The red box indicates media supplemented with brain heart infusion and activated charcoal intended to counteract the inhibiting effects of antibiotics on blood culture yield. These bottles have demonstrated increased recovery of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria when in the presence of antibiotics. The blood culture collection process performed at the bedside is described here. First things first, all necessary supplies should be compiled. For example, alcohol pads, butterfly media and syringe, adapter, and the desired media bottles, which as stated before, are typically the standard aerobic and anaerobic bottles. The current method of blood sample collection that we employ at the University of California Davis Medical Center is venipuncture, shown here in step two, where 20 milliliters of blood is drawn into a syringe using a butterfly needle. 
The volume of blood drawn for infants is between 2 to 4 milliliters, depending on weight. Some hospitals may use two separate syringes, drawing 10 milliliters of blood into each. Before dosing the bottles, the tops of the bottles must be thoroughly sterilized using alcohol pads, shown here in step 3. Next, when using the same syringe as shown here for the 20 milliliters of blood, the aerobic bottle is dosed with 10 milliliters of blood, followed by the anaerobic bottle with 10 milliliters. The reason for dosing the aerobic bottle first is to prevent any air which may have entered the syringe from being inserted into the anaerobic bottle. Lastly, invert the bottles to mix the contents. Do not shake. Lastly, not shown here, send the bottles to the clinical microbiology laboratory for culture and analysis. Please note that while the collection protocol calls for performing venipuncture whenever possible, depending on the patient, it may not always be the best method. For example, in severely burned patients, venipuncture is not recommended due to the lack of innate barrier to infection and possible contamination. In this case, blood is drawn from a line, frequently an arterial line. The issue here is contamination. The growth of certain species of gram-positive bacteria, frequently the common skin contaminant Staphylococcus epidermidis, a coagulase-negative Staphylococci, often reflects contamination or arterial line colonization, whereas the growth of gram-negative bacteria may be indicative of bacteremia. These photos were taken from our clinical microbiology laboratory to describe the blood culture process post-sample collection. In the upper left photo labeled 1, we have the standard set of blood culture bottles, aerobic on the left and anaerobic on the right. The blood culture bottles are placed into an automated incubator, shown in step 2. Incubation is for 5 to 7 days, although most pathogens will grow within 1 to 2 days, and often extended for 14 to 21 days for suspected bacterial endocarditis, brucella, or yeast. However, some controversy exists on the extended incubation time. Bottles are continuously monitored for microbial growth. At the base of each bottle, there is an indicator which signals microbial growth by indirectly measuring the carbon dioxide production with pH change in the bottle. The pH is red by the color change at the bottom of the bottle. The indicator changes from blue-gray to yellow. Yellow is indicative of a positive result, shown in step 3 here at the bottom right. Once flagged by the system as positive, an inoculum of the positive culture is used for gram staining, a process I will describe in detail in a few slides. Another inoculum is streaked onto growth media plates, for example, sheep blood auger, chocolate auger, or brucella auger. The media plates chosen depends on the results of the gram stain. At this point, the morphology, i.e. gram stain result, is reported to the clinician. Subcultures require time to incubate and grow, which may take another 24 hours. Once the subcultured plates grow out, speciation and antimicrobial susceptibility testing are performed. The subculture plate shown on the upper far right is sheep blood auger, while the subculture photo to the right of that shows a split plate auger. On the right half of the plate, we have sheep blood auger and on the left, McConkie auger. McConkie is a selective media for gram-negative enteric pathogens. In short, laboratorians are able to differentiate lactose versus non-lactose fermenting isolates with this media. We will expand on various agar types used for discriminating organisms later. Step 1 of the speciation and antimicrobial susceptibility testing process involves creating a suspension in culture broth using a single isolated colony from the subculture plate. This is performed by gently scraping the colony from the plate with a sterile inoculating loop. Placing the loop in the broth and gently stirring will release the colony from the loop creating the suspension. The photo on the bottom left shows three biochemical test plates for organism speciation and antimicrobial susceptibility testing. The biochemical tests allow laboratorians to profile the metabolic characteristics phenotypes of the organism to speciate. To perform this test, the laboratorian fills the test plates with the speciation with the suspension created in culture broth, shown in step two. The plates are loaded into an automated reader in step 3, which provides a final result 16 hours later. This result is then reported to the physician, which may or may not alter the original treatment regimen. For example, an organism initially identified by gram stain as a gram-positive staphylococcus 
which could possibly indicate either methicillin-sensitive or resistant Staphylococcus aureus, may be treated with vancomycin, a glycopeptide antibiotic. But if upon antimicrobial susceptibility testing, the organism is actually identified as a methicillin-sensitive Staphylococcus aureus rather than methicillin-resistant, the physician may change the therapy to nafcillin, a beta-lactam antibiotic. A urine culture is performed to identify organisms that may be causing a urinary tract infection, or UTI. Urine in the bladder normally is sterile. It does not contain any bacteria or other organisms. But bacteria can enter the urethra and cause an infection. This oftentimes occurs in critically ill patients with urinary catheters. The urine culture procedure is described in this slide. Before sample collection begins, all necessary supplies must be obtained. For example, sterile collection container and vacutainer. Urine is collected in the sterile container. For patients without bladder catheters, a midstream clean catch should be performed. In critically ill patients, for example shown here in step 2, the source of the urine for collection comes from the catheter port or collection bag. Some argue that urine should not come from the collection bag because it is possible that organisms may replicate while in the bag. Step 3 involves inserting the vacutainer into the container for urine sample retrieval. The urine sample should be transported to the laboratory promptly, shown here in Step 4, so as to prevent multiplication of bacteria or fungi in the receptacle. Culture results usually can be obtained within 24 to 48 hours. The presence of a single type of bacteria growing at high colony counts greater than 10,000 colony forming units per milliliter is considered a positive urine culture. A culture that is reported as no growth in 24 or 48 hours or less than 10,000 CFUs per mil usually indicates that there is no infection. If the symptoms persist, however, the culture may be repeated to look for presence of bacteria at lower colony counts, i.e. less than 10,000 CFUs per milliliter, or other, micro other microorganisms that may cause these symptoms. If a culture shows growth of several different types of bacteria, then it is likely that the growth is due to contamination. This is especially true if the organism present include lactobacillus and or other common non-pathogenic vaginal bacteria in women. If the result is in fact positive, according to Step 5, sensitivity testing, like in blood culture, should be performed in order to decide appropriate antimicrobial therapy. Wounds are injuries to the body tissue caused by disease processes or events such as burns, punctures, and human or animal bites. Wounds or abscesses also occur within body tissues as a result of surgery or dental procedures. Wounds become infected when microorganisms from the outside environment or from within the person's body enter the open wound and multiply. A fever following surgery may be indicative of an infection at the site of surgery. Blood cultures are frequently positive in invasive wound infections. A wound that is red, painful, swollen, and draining pus is probably infected and a skin and soft tissue culture should be performed. The procedure is outlined here. Firstly, the sterile culture collection kit must be obtained. This kit typically contains a swab and a sterile collection tube. Secondly, the swab is rotated over the middle area over the wound carefully so as to avoid contact to the surrounding edges. This will minimize possible contamination caused by normal skin flora. Lastly, the swab is placed in the collection tube, labeled and promptly sent to the clinical microbiology laboratory where the specimen will be spread over auger and incubated. That concludes our overview of culture procedures for this lecture. Now let's move on to staining procedures which are designed for identifying cellular morphology. Staining can be performed with basic dyes such as crystal violet or methylene blue. These positively charged dyes are attracted to the negatively charged materials of the microbial cytoplasm. The basic procedure using crystal violet or methylene blue dyes is called the simple stain procedure. The steps illustrated in the figure are as follows. First, prepare a heat-fixed smear of the culture you wish to examine. This is shown in step 1 on the top half of the figure. To do this, you will either transfer a loop full of liquid suspension containing bacteria to a slide, or transfer the edge of a colony from a culture plate to a slide with a water drop. 
It is important for the latter to obtain organisms from the edge of a colony because these are the healthiest and youngest organisms best capable of dividing. Once you've transferred the organisms, smear them gently in the center of the slide so you can create a homogeneous smear. Once it is air dried, pass it through a flame a few times to heat fix. This will be your heat fix smear. The next step, step two, shown in the bottom half of the figure, will be the staining procedure. First, cover the smear with methylene blue. Allow the dye to remain on the smear for approximately one minute. Note, staining time is not critical. Somewhere between 30 seconds and two minutes should give you an acceptable stain. The longer you leave the dye on in general, the darker the stain. Pick up the slide by one end and hold it at an angle over the staining tray. Using the distilled water wash bottle, gently wash off the excess methylene blue from the slide by di directing a gentle stream of water over the surface of the slide. Wash off any stain that got on the bottom of the slide as well. Saturate the smear again, but this time with iodine. This will set the stain. Wash off any excess iodine. Blot the slide using bibulous paper. It is important not to rub the slide, rather place the slide between two sheets of bibulous paper and press down gently. This will preserve the organisms on the slide and the paper will absorb any excess dyes. Examine the slide under the Brightfield microscope. Viewing under 100x with oil immersion will give you the best view of your bacteria, as shown here on the bottom right. This is because the oil used has the same refractive index as air. Record the shape, arrangement, and approximate size of the organisms. The next stain is a differential stain technique called the gram stain, which distinguishes between two groups of bacteria, gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria. This procedure is, procedure is illustrated in the top portion of the figure labeled A. First, crystal violet is applied, followed by the mordant iodine after rinsing. Then the slide is washed with alcohol and rinsed. Gram-positive bacteria retain the crystal violet iodine stain, but the gram-negative bacteria lose the stain. However, it is important not to leave the alcohol on for too long, i.e. greater than 10 seconds, because it will penetrate the gram-positive cell wall and allow for the stain to escape, like the gram-negatives. Next, a counter stain called safranin is applied and the slide is rinsed and finally blotted dry. The gram-negative bacteria will absorb the safranin dye. These bacteria appear red under the oil immersion lens, while gram-positive bacteria appear blue or purple, reflecting the crystal violet retained during the washing step. This is shown in the lower left of the figure labeled B. Antibiotic susceptibility tests and biochemical tests must be performed for detailed differentiation of organisms. An example of a gram-positive coccus stained with crystal violet dye in the figure is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, the causative agent of many skin infections. A gram-positive bacillus stained with crystal violet could be Carinibacterium diphtheriae, the causative agent of diphtheria, and a gram-negative vibrio stained with safranin may be vibrio cholera, the causative agent of cholera. A schematic of gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls is shown in the lower right of the slide. Notice the difference in thickness of the peptidoglycan layer in each of the cell walls. The reason the crystal violet remains in the gram-positive cell wall upon alcohol wash is due to its increased thickness relative to the gram-negative cell wall. Spore production is an important characteristic of some bacteria, allowing them to resist adverse environmental conditions such as desiccation, chemical exposure, extreme heat, etc. The identification of spores is also an important is, is important to the clinical microbiologist for analyzing a patient's body fluid or tissue since there are not that many spore-forming genera. In fact, there are two major pathogenic spore-forming genera, Bacillus and Clostridium, together causing a number of lethal diseases such as botulism, gangrene, tetanus, and anthrax. The primary dye, malachite green, binds relatively weakly to the cell wall and spore wall. In fact, if washed well with water, the dye comes right out of the cell wall. However, not from the spore wall once the dye is locked in. That is why there is no need for a decolorizer in this stain. It is based on the binding of the malachite green and the permeability of the spore versus cell wall. The steaming required in the procedure helps the malachite green to permeate the spore wall. The procedure is illustrated in this slide. First, make a heat fix smear of the organism. Next, cut a small piece of paper towel and place it on the top of the slide over the smear. 
The towel will keep the, dry, the dye from evaporating too quickly, thereby giving more contact time between the dye and the bacterial walls. Flood the smear with malachite green dye and leave for 5 minutes. Keep the paper towel moist with the malachite green. Do not let the dye dry on the towel. Pass the slide over the Bunsen burner approximately every 30 seconds to maintain a steady amount of stream, steam coming off the slide. Add malachite green when necessary to keep the paper towel saturated during this process. Remove and discard the small paper towel piece. Wash thoroughly with water. Place the smear over the sink and flood the smear with the counter stain saffronin and leave for one minute. Lastly, rinse, blot dry, and view under the microscope. Spores will be light green and vegetative cells will pick up the counter stain saffronin, making them red. An alternate to using the basic positively charged dyes such as methylene blue and crystal violet is to use acidic negatively charged dyes such as negrosin or Congo red. They are repelled by the negatively charged cytoplasm and gather around the cells, leaving the cells clear and unstained. This technique is called the negative stain technique, which is illustrated in the figure. First place a very small drop of India ink on one side of the slide. Transfer a portion of a colony from the culture plate to the slide. Place the edge of a cover slip on the drop of India ink containing bacteria and gently slide the edge of the cover slip across the slide so as to create a concentration gradient of ink and drop the outer edge of the so the slip covers the slide. The India ink should be spread across the slide in a thin layer. The smoky gray area of the stain indicated with a circle here is the area for viewing under the microscope. The bottom far right photo shows an example of the capsules visualized with the negative stain at 100x magnification. The photomicrograph is slightly enlarged for clarity. The cells of Streptococcus pneumoniae here are surrounded by a dark background while the capsule is in the clear area surrounding cells. Another differential staining technique is the acid fast staining technique. This technique differentiates species of mycobacterium from other bacteria. Heat or lipid solvent is used to carry the first stain, carbofusion, into the cells. Then the cells are washed with a dilute acid alcohol solution. Next, the smear is saturated with methylene blue, rinsed and blotted dry. Mycobacterium species resist the effect of the acid alcohol and retain the carbofusion stain, which is bright red. Other bacteria lose the stain and take on the subsequent methylene blue stain. Thus, the acid fast bacteria appear bright red, while the non-acid fast bacteria appear blue when observed under oil immersion microscopy. This slide is a summary slide illustrating the end products of the key stains discussed. Going clockwise from the upper left, we have the gram stain, spore stain, acid fast stain, and negative stain, where you can visualize gram-positive versus negative bacteria, endospores versus vegetative cells, mycobacterium versus other organisms, and capsulated versus non-capsulated organisms, respectively. There are many ways to differentiate organisms. Staining is one way. Now I would like to talk about other ways to differentiate using specific biochemical tests. This slide shows various ways of differentiating Staphylococcus species, including Staphylococcus aureus, both methicillin-sensitive and methicillin-resistant, or MRSA for short, strains from other organisms after the gram stain identified a gram-positive coccus. I will describe each test in detail in a clockwise fashion, beginning with the upper left technique shown here. Phenol red mannitol auger is used for differentiating pure cultures of bacteria based on mannitol fermentation reactions. The slant is inoculated by stabbing the media to the bottom and streaking the surface of the slant. Fermentation of the carbohydrate is in indicated by a change in the color of the medium from red to cannery yellow. This is indicative of a positive result. Gas formation is indicated by the collection of gas bubbles in the base or by splitting of the auger. Catalase is a common enzyme found in some organisms which functions to catalyze the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. The test is done by placing a drop of hydrogen peroxide on a microscope slide. Using an applicator stick, a scientist touches the colony and then smears a sample onto the hydrogen peroxide drop. 
If bubbles or froth forms, the organism is said to be catalase positive. Staphylococci and micrococci are catalase positive. If not, the organism is catalase negative. Streptococci and enterococci are catalase negative. While the catalase test alone cannot identify a particular organism, combined with other tests such as antibiotic resistance, it can aid in diagnosis. The presence of catalase in bacterial cells depends on both the growth condition and the medium used to grow the cells. Blood auger is used frequently to grow out most organisms, but it can act as a differential media as well. It differentiates bacteria on their ability to lyse red blood cells. The media contains sheep's blood auger and nutrient auger. If a bacterium lyses the right red blood cells, then a zone of clearing is formed around the colonies. The zone of clearing can vary in magnitude based on the organism's ability to perform hemolysis. Alpha hemolysis occurs when an organism is capable of partially digesting the red blood cells and is represented by the partial zone of clearing with the gray-green colorization. Beta hemolysis occurs when an organism is capable of completely digesting red blood cells and is represented by the complete zone of clearing with yellow tint. Gamma hemolysis describes a culture of bacteria with minimal to no hemolysis. Mannitol salt auger also has nutrients appropriate for the growth of Staphylococcus and 7.5% salt which will further select for Staphylococcus. Additionally, this media contains mannitol and a phenol red indicator that will turn yellow in the presence of mannitol fermenting Staphylococcus. Hence, this media is selective and differential. It differentiates Staphylococcus on its ability to ferment mannitol. Coagulase is an enzyme produced by Staphylococcus aureus that converts fibrinogen to fibrin. The coagulase test is used to differentiate Staphylococcus aureus from coagulase negative Staphylococci. The test uses rabbit plasma that has been inoculated with the Staphylococcal col colony. The tube is incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for one and a half hours. If negative, then the incubation is continued for up to 24 hours. If positive, i.e. the suspect colony is Staphylococcus aureus, the serum will coagulate, resulting in a clot. Sometimes the clot is so pronounced that the liquid will completely solidify. If negative, the plasma remains liquid. The negative result may be a coagulase negative Staphylococcus species, such as Staphylococcus epidermidis. But a more detailed biochemical identification test, for example, an API strip, which I will explain in a few slides, must confirm this. Chrome auger MRSA is selective differential medium which incorporates cefoxetin for qualitative detection of MRSA from anterior NAR specimens. This test is used here at the University of California Davis Medical Center for MRSA screening. It is not used, however, for diagnosis and treatment in patients with MRSA. More about these types of tests is described on the following slide. A test that is not listed here that we perform in our clinical microbiology lab at UC Davis Medical Center is the latex test. This test contains antibodies attached to microscopic latex beads that are specific to Staphylococcus aureus only. If the organism is Staphylococcus aureus, then the antibodies will agglutinate in the Staphylococcus aureus cells and clump the latex beads together to give a speckled appearance on the test card. There are various types of auger for specific detection and differentiation of MRSA. Some are listed here with their turnaround times in hours, sampling sites, clinical sensitivity and specificity, and positive and negative predictive values. Quantitative values are all listed in percents. Some tests have multiple values depending on turnaround time. The subsequent production companies are listed below the table. One point I would like to make is that the sensitivities are lower than the specificities in most of the tests, indicating that these are MRSA detection methods are better at ruling in MRSA infection than ruling out infection. An easy way to remember that specificity rules in and sensitivity rules out are the words spin and snout. Another key point here is that turnaround times range from 18 to 48 hours. These are rather slow turnaround times relative to some nucleic acid assays such as polymerase chain reaction or PCR, which have demonstrated turnaround times of less than one hour. Therefore, I propose that nucleic acid recognition 
tests for MRSA with faster turnaround times, i.e. less than one hour, may be more clinically useful for screening purposes. This slide shows various auger plates containing specific nutrients for differentiating gram-negative organisms. The top left photo shows McConkie auger, which differentiates lactose fermenting, i.e. lac-positive organisms, from non-lactose fermenting, i.e. lac-negative organisms, via a pH indicator. It contains bile salt salts to inhibit most gram-positive bacteria, except Enterococcus and some species of Staphylococcus. Crystal violet dye, which also inhibits certain gram-positive bacteria. Neutral red dye, which stains microbes fermenting lactose, lactose, and peptone. By utilizing the lactose available in the medium, lac-positive bacteria such as Escherichia coli, Enterobacter, and Klebsiella will produce acid, which lowers the pH of the auger below 6.8 and results in the appearance of pink-red colonies. Non-lactose fermenting bacteria such as Salmonella, Proteus species, and Shigella cannot utilize lactose and will use peptone instead. This forms ammonia, which raises the pH of the auger and leads to the formation of white or color colorless colonies or appear the same color as the medium. Some organisms ferment lactose slowly or weakly and are sometimes put in their own category. These include Serratia and Citrobacter. The bottom left photo shows F auger, sometimes called flow auger. It is used to stimulate production of the pigment fluorescein. This allows for specific detection of pseudomonas species. Note the intense fluorescence of the pigment fluorescein under UV light. A shows pseudomonas fluores fluorescens growing on nutrient auger in ambient light. B shows pseudomonas fluorescens growing on nutrient auger in ultraviolet light. C shows pseudomonas fluorescens growing on F auger in ambient light, while D shows pseudomonas fluorescens growing on F auger in ultraviolet light. The top right photo shows eosin methylene blue auger, which is both selective and differential. It contains the dyes eosin and methylene blue, which inhibit the growth of gram-positive bacteria and therefore select for gram-negative bacteria. It also contains the carbohydrate lactose, which allows differentiation of gram-negative bacteria based on their ability to ferment lactose. Growth on all three segments of EMB auger indicates all three organisms cultured are not inhibited by eosin and methylene blue and are gram-negative bacteria. The green metallic sheen in the far right section of the auger indicates the bacterium is able to ferment lactose to produce strong acid end products. This could be an example of Escherichia coli. The absence of color in the bacterial growth in the far left section of the auger indicates the bacterium is unable to ferment lactose. This could be an example of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. The pink color of the bacterial growth in the middle section of the auger indicates the bacterium is able to ferment lactose to produce weak acid end products. This could be an example of Enterobacter aerogenes. Not shown in this photo is absence of growth, which would indicate the organism is inhibited by eosin and methylene blue and is a gram-positive bacterium. An example could be Staphylococcus aureus. Shown here are MVIC tests, which are useful for differentiating the Enterobacteriaceae family, especially when used alongside the urease test. Except for the lowercase i, which is added for ease of pronunciation, each of the letters in MVIC stands for one of these tests. I is for indole, M is for methyl red, V is for vogues proskauer and C is for citrate. Indole production is an important characteristic in the identification of many species of microorganisms. In the indole test, the organism under consideration is grown in peptone water broth. It contains tryptophan, which under ac the action of enzyme tryptophanase is converted to an indole molecule, pyruvate and carbon dioxide. The indole is then extracted from the broth by means of xylene. To test the broth for indole production, COVAX reagent is added. A positive result is indicated by a pink-red layer forming on top of the liquid, as shown in the upper left photo. Escherichia coli produces a positive indole test, while members of the Klebsiella enterobacter hafnia serratia group are all mostly negative. The vogues proskauer and methyl red tests shown in the upper left and upper right photos use MRVP broth, which enables both tests to be performed in the same medium, although in different tubes or on aliquots 
from the same tube. After growth, the broth is separated into two different tubes, one for methyl red test and one for the vogues proskauer test. The vogues proskauer test uses alpha naphthol and potassium hydroxide to indicate a positive or negative test. A positive test is indicated by a burnt orange brick red color change on the surface of the liquid. This indicates butane diol fermentation. For the methyl red test, the pH indicator methyl red is added to a tube containing the organism in question. Enterics that subsequently metabolize pyruvic acid to other acids, for example Escherichia coli and Proteus vulgaris, lower the pH of the medium to 4.2. At this pH, methyl red turns red. A red color represents a positive test. Enterics that subsequently metabolize pyruvic acid to neutral acid end products, for example, for example Serratia marcescens and Enterobacter aerogenes, lower the pH of the medium to only 6.0. At this pH, methyl red is yellow. A yellow color represents a negative test. pHs in between 4.2 and 6.0 will change the pH indicator color to orange. The citrate test uses citrate agar which contains citrate, ammonium ions, and other inorganic ions needed for growth. It also contains bromothymol blue, a pH indicator. Bromothymol blue is green at pH below 6.9 and blue at pH of 7.6 or greater, indicating a negative and positive result respectively. This test is used to determine the ability of a microorganism to use citrate as its sole carbon source and ammonium ions as the sole nitrogen source. An example of an organism negative for citrate utilization is Escherichia coli. An example of an organism positive for citrate utilization is Enterobacter aerogenes. The Analytical Profile Index, or API system, consists of a plastic strip of 20 individual mini miniaturized test tubes, or cupule cupules, each containing a different reagent used to determine the metabolic capabilities and, ultimately, the genus and species of gram-negative enteric bacteria in the Enterobacteriaceae family. Each cupule is inoculated with a saline suspension of a pure bacterial culture, rehydrating the dried reagent in each tube. Some of the tubes are to be completely filled, for example, tests CIT, VP, and GEL, whereas others are topped off with mineral oil so that the anaerobic reactions can be carried out, for example, tests ADH, LDC, ODC, H2S, and URE. The strip is then incubated in a small plastic humidity chamber for 24 to 48 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. The reagents in the cupules are specifically designed to test for the presence of products of bacterial metabolism specific to certain kinds of bacteria. After incubation, each cupule is assessed for a specific color change indicating the presence of a metabolic reaction that sheds light on the microbe's identity. Some of the cupules contain content change color due to pH differences. Others contain end products that have to be identified using additional reagents. Interpretation of the 20 reactions, in addition to the oxidase reaction, which is done separately, is converted to a seven-digit code. The technician can then look up the code in a manual that has the names of bacterial species associated which, with each seven-digit code. We just talked a great deal about bacteria, but bacteria are not the only pathogenic organisms out there. Other pathogens include parasites, fungi, and viruses. I will briefly mention information specifically pertaining to the latter two. A fungus is a member of the large group of eukaryotic organisms, including yeast and molds. The study of fungi is known as mycology. Most fungi grow in hyphae form of size 2 to 10 micrometers in diameter and several centimeters in length. New hyphae are grown via a process called branching. Many become visible to the naked eye and can be seen on surfaces such as damp walls, spoiled foods, and even infected patients. Fungi can reproduce both sexually and asexually and through spore dispersal. Besides regular sexual reproduction with meiosis, certain fungi such as those in genera Penicillium and Aspergillus may also exchange genetic material via parasexual processes initiated by anastomosis between hyphae and plasmogamy of fungal cells. Fungi are different in the majority of aspects from the prokaryotic bacteria. 
The exception is that both organisms have cell walls. However, the cell wall of a fungus is made out of chitin, not peptidoglycan, as in bacteria. Many fungi have important symbiotic relationships with organisms from most, if not all, kingdoms. These interactions can be mutualistic or antagonistic in nature, or, in the case of commensal fungi, are of no apparent benefit or detriment to the host. Like other eukaryotes, fungal cells contain membrane-bound nuclei with linear chromosomes. In addition, fungi possess membrane-bound cytoplasmic organelles, such as mitochondria, sterile containing membranes, and ribosomes of the ADS type, similar to humans. This ribosomal similarity poses toxicity issues with certain antimicrobials targeting the ribosomes. The study of viruses is known as virology. In Latin, virus means toxin or poison. A virus is a small infectious agent that can only replicate inside the cells of another organism. Viral populations do not grow through cell division because they are acellular. Rather, they use the cell machinery and metabolism of a host cell to produce multiple copies of themselves while assembling in the cell. Viruses display a wide diversity of morphologies and have approximate diameters ranging between 10 and 300 nanometers, too small to be seen directly with a light mi microscope, but can effectively be seen via electron microscopy. Viruses can infect all types of organisms, including humans and bacteria. A complete virus particle is known as a virion, which consists of nucleic acid surrounded by a protective protein coat called, called a capsid. Viruses must generate mRNA from their genomes to produce proteins and replicate themselves. Different mechanisms are used to achieve this in each virus family. The Baltimore classification system, devised by Nobel Prize winner David Baltimore, categorizes viruses based on their mechanism of mRNA production. Viral genomes may be DNA or RNA, circular or linear, single-stranded or double-stranded, and may or may not use reverse transcriptase. Additionally, single-stranded RNA viruses may be either positive sense, denoted by a plus sign, or negative sense, sometimes called antisense, denoted by a negative sign. This classification places viruses into seven groups, shown here in the figure on the bottom right. Examples of viruses falling into each class are listed to the left of the figure. Influenza, commonly referred to as the flu, is an infectious disease caused by RNA viruses of the Orthomyxoviridae family. Influenza spreads around the world in seasonal epidemics. There are three types of influenza viruses, influenza A, B, and C. Influenza type A viruses are the most virulent human pathogens among the three influenza types and cause the most severe disease. The influenza A virus can be subdivided into different serotypes based on the antibody response to these viruses. Some of these include, but are not limited to, H1N1, seasonal and novel, H2N2, H3N2, and H5N1, avian flu. On June 11, 2009, the World Health Organization declared a novel H1N1 pandemic. The 2009 flu pandemic is a global outbreak of a new strain of H1N1 influenza virus, often referred to colloquially as swine flu. Although the virus first detected in April 2009 contains a combination of genes from swine, avian, and human influenza viruses, it cannot be spread by eating pork or pork products. The novel H1N1 strain achieves sustained human-to-human -human transmission in multiple global regions, prompting additional measures to be taken to facilitate rapid detection and isolation of infected patients. Antiviral resistant H1N1 strains, for, exa for example, H275Y mutation, have also been identified. According to the weekly World Health Organization report on novel H1N1 given on December 30, 2009, as of the 27th of December 2009, worldwide, more than 208 countries and overseas territories or communities have reported laboratory-confirmed cases of pandemic influenza H1N1 2009, including at least 12,220 deaths. The reported number of fatal cases is an underrepresentation of the actual numbers as many deaths are never tested or recognized as influenza related and most countries focus surveillance and laboratory testing only on people with severe illness. 
In addition, the data continues to confirm previous findings that this disease primarily affects people younger than 65 years old with the number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths overwhelmingly occurring in people 64 years and younger. The risk of illness, hospitalization, and death related to the 2009 H1N1 is very age-specific and very different from seasonal influenza. With seasonal influenza, about 60% of seasonal flu-related hospitalizations and 90% of flu-related deaths occur in people 65 years and older. One particular virulence factor of the novel H1N1 virus is that it possesses the ability to infect deeper lung tissue compared to the seasonal flu. This can lead to severe complications involving alveolar damage. Research also suggests that the severity of acute respiratory distress syndrome from damaged alveoli is linked to genetic variations in immune systems. The CDC recommends diagnostic testing for hospitalized patients with suspected influenza and to aid to help aid in clinical decision making for critical care, infection control, and management of close contact. Rapid detection facilitates early intervention, allows initiation of protective measures for high-risk groups exposed to infected individuals, and improves triaging and utilization of resources, thereby decreasing hospital bed shortages and improving treatment decisions. Despite the CDC's recommendations, our nation was not prepared for a pandemic. No point-of-care instrument, device, or test kit was available to detect novel H1N1 with high sensitivity and specificity. A point-of-care novel H1N1 influenza test will allow organizations to map outbreaks and allocate appropriate prevention, control, and treatment resources. Current rapid point-of-care influenza immunoassays offer qualitative testing for influenza A and or B, but generally are not capable of subtyping strains. Immunoassays are capable only of non-specifically detecting novel H1N1 virus in 10 to 70 percent of clinical samples, thus limiting their capacity for reliable diagnosis. The recommended method for confirming no novel H1N1 is nucleic acid testing using real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction and viral culture. Real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction tests have gained emergency use authorization from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, but generally require expensive laboratory equipment and highly trained personnel. Additionally, the assay used and the sample tested may affect the accuracy of diagnostic testing. There is a need for flexible and adaptable point-of-care technologies that can detect not just novel H1N1, but also provide suitable detection platforms for future pandemic threats and antiviral drug-resistant strains. This pandemic illustrates the need for point-of-care devices capable of responding to emerging threats. For example, effective quarantine strategies require highly sensitive and highly specific diagnostic tests to quickly identify index cases. Availability of these tests will help optimize vaccine and antiviral drug distribution in low-resource countries. This Venn diagram illustrates available diagnostic testing methods for bacterial, fungal, and viral infections. The left blue circle represents viral testing methods, the right yellow circle represents bacterial testing methods, while the bottom green circle represents fungal testing methods. Each overlapping section represents diagnostic testing methods available for detecting all three types of pathogens, or any combination of the three. We see here that the majority of available assays can be used to detect viruses, fungi, and bacteria, including traditional methods such as serology and culture. Immunoassays and nucleic acid recognition assays such as polymerase chain reaction and loop-mediated isothermal amplification are constantly evolving. Many of the currently available assays are laboratory-based but exhibit potential to be used at the point of care. Rapid and highly sensitive and specific point-of-care nucleic acid recognition assays represent the future for diagnostic testing. In summary, traditional culture methods such as blood, urine, skin, and soft tissue cultures are performed when there is suspected infection. Although they exhibit slower therapeutic turnaround times, inhibition from antimicrobials, and sometimes greater potential for contamination, Culture methods are available for detecting most bacterial, fungal, and viral infections. 
Various culture media, such as media with activated charcoal, have been developed for improving blood culture yield normally impeded by antibiotics. Once cultures become positive, various staining procedures can be performed for identifying bacterial cell morphologies. Highly specific staining procedures can actually be used for differentiating organisms. One specific example given in this lecture was the acid fast stain for detecting mycobacterium tuberculosis. Additionally, biochemical tests such as the coagulase test and selective media such as chrome auger can be used for differentiating bacterial species such as Staphylococcus aureus from Staphylococcus epidermidis. In addition to the traditional culture methods, staining procedures, and biochemical tests, molecular assays have become increasingly favorable. Currently, however, many of these assays are strictly laboratory-based and require expensive equipment. There is a need for flexible, adaptable, and affordable point-of-care technologies that can detect a wide variety of infections. For example, the current novel H1N1 pandemic has demonstrated a need for suitable detection platforms for future pandemic threats and antiviral drug-resistant strains. In conclusion, rapid and highly sensitive and specific multiplex point-of-care nucleic acid recognition assays represent the future for diagnostic testing.